you enjoy reading mystery thrillers, I've got a great show for you. This is Robert Manny, host of Guys Guys TV, and this week my special guest is one of the best writers on the beat, John Gilstrap. It all starts right here, right now on Guys Guys TV. You can also catch me on Guys Guys Radio, my worldwide podcast, and KCAA Radio right here in Southern California. Guys Guys TV, Guys Guys Radio, thanks for your support. Okay, today we're going to talk about thrillers, action thrillers, those novels, they read fast, there's lots of action, and we've got one of the greats of the genre, John Gilstrap is here with us today. Let me tell you a little bit about John and his work. His fans know him by probably his most famous protagonist, a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Graves. All, we all know that his work is jam-packed with pulse-pounding action, diabolical criminals, fast-paced pursuits, stomach-nodding tension, and justice will be served. The New York Times bestselling author has been praised as America's most accomplished thriller writer, championed by fellow writers, everybody from Jeffrey Deaver, Harlan Coban. He is the author of award-winning action novels, including the Jonathan Grave thriller series and the new Victoria Emerson thrillers. He's a master of action-driven suspense. His books have been translated into 20 languages, and John's the recipient of the International Thriller Writers Award, for Against All Enemies and the AOL Alex Award for Nathan's Run, which I believe is his first book. And he was a two-time ITW Award finalist. Uh, he's a nationally recognized weaponry and explosive expert, safety expert, pardon me, as well as a National Shooting Sports Foundation member. So maybe we'll touch on that because it's so much in the news these days. John frequently speaks at conferences, events, clubs, youth programs, military bases. He's interestingly enough, a former fighter, fire, firefighter and an EMT. He's got a master's degree in safety from uh, USC and a bachelor's from William and Mary in Virginia. He also has a great YouTube channel, which I highly recommend, where he shares terrific tips and insights for expiring writers. His new book is called Lethal Game. So instead of my going through the whole book, let's bring John out right now. Welcome to Guys Guys Radio, John Gilstrap. Such a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure, and you do great work. Let's start right at the beginning. What inspired you to become a writer, and particularly in the thriller genre? You not only had a day job, you actually went back to it after you were first published with Nathan's Run. Well, that's true. There's never been a time that I don't remember not writing. That was That's triple negative there, okay? I don't remember a time when I was not writing. Uh, as soon as I could pick up a pencil and and draw letters, you know, I was always writing stories, whether it's writing it for my mom, who always thought I was the most brilliant author on the planet, um, or, you know, just for myself. So the, the writing thing has always been there. And as far as the genre, you know, it, all I read, certainly growing up, I, I thrived on mysteries and thrillers. The Hardy Boys and Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators, and then moving on to Alistair McLean and Frederick Forsyth and 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 and, um, and it's kind of an adrenaline junkie thing in in on the page. I'm sort of an adrenaline junkie in in real life too. But as far as the actual first book, Nathan's Run, it was actually my fourth book, and uh, the other three <laughs> just, just sucked, but they each sucked less than the one that preceded it. So, you know, it, ultimately you, you get something that works. And Nathan's Run, you know, when it hit, it hit big. It was my, my first novel and it just, it, it was a runaway bestseller. And it made sense. Actually, I didn't quit the day job yet. I, I wrote a second book because one in a row is not a trend, uh, but two in a row is, I thought. And so at all costs was my second book. And there's been 25 since then. But along the way, somewhere around book five or six, um, we were becoming empty nesters. My wife was going back to work and I was still I was like 40, 45 years old, something like that. And it just, you know, playing with my imaginary friends didn't, I, I missed the juice of being in a workplace. Yeah. So I went back to work and continued to produce a thriller a year while I was working 80 hours a week at a, at a big boy job. Oh, that's it's fa fa fascinating and fantastic. Um, let me get off script for a second, just to follow up on that. How did you find the time to write when you were doing a full-time job early, late? Yeah, I, yes. Um, I, I've, we each we are blessed with 24 hours in the day and we each get the same 24 hours. And I was actually inspired at the time, Tom Clancy. I, I don't 
I've, I've never met Tom Clancy, um, but, but his bio, his story was, I think he was an insurance salesman or he had something to do with insurance. Mm-hmm. And, and he did the research and writing of the hunt for Red October in his spare time. And I read about John Grisham, who was a practicing lawyer, and he wrote his books in his spare time. And, you know, and everybody's got kids and everybody's got family. So everybody's kind of balancing the same thing. So I began to think, well, okay, if, if they can do it, then I can do it. It's just a matter of what don't you do. And, you know, I, I stopped watching television at night. I got up a little bit earlier. I went to bed a little bit later. And over time, you know, three, four pages a day, that's the book pretty fast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We'll get into that. A second part of our interview, I want to get into the process to really help the aspiring and the current writers who are out there to hear the tips from a real expert. So, John, let me ask you something else here. The, the thriller genre, how, how do you define the thriller and the genre? And why do you think it's so popular, with particularly with guys? Well, you know, the, I think thrillers, the basic structure of the modern thriller, to my eye, is the same as the basic structure of the classic Western. You know, whether it's Jack Reacher or Jonathan Grave or the, somebody with special skills or special outlook rides into town, helps the innocent, saves them from the bad guys, and then rides away. You know, that's, that is the, the plot of the vast number of thrillers. And I think it's just engaging. I think that seeing justice brought to bad guys, sometimes in dramatic ways, sometimes not, I, I just think it's very engaging and, and satisfying. But there, there's an inherent problem in a lot of thrillers, and that is that characters can get lost. You know, it's the juice of action, 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 action. Um, actually, I think it works better on the screen than it does on the page. People need to have characters that they care about doing interesting things in interesting ways. And, and that's the slice of writing, whether it's thrillers or mysteries or romance or you know whatever, is is developing the character that people care about enough to stay with them through through all of the adventures. But it's just, you know, I, I it's an addictive adrenaline rush kind of kind of story where the stakes are usually high. They don't have to be. Um, or the stakes are really high for the individual that the fictional individual that the reader cares about. Mm-hmm. And that's, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, or not. Abso- absolutely. And more. Um, tell us about Jonathan Grave, the new book. And I have John Gilstrap uh, as my special guest, New York Times bestselling author uh, here on Guys Guys Radio. Uh, we're talking about Lethal Game is the new one just coming out now end of June just came out. Um, what, what, tell us about Jonathan Grade. You were talking about character. What drives him? What does he want? And what is, what are the obstacles that confront him? In other words, what does he want and why can't he get it? The usual, you know, template for a good story. Well, Jonathan Grave is a, is a freelance hostage rescue specialist. His background, uh, he's a former uh, Delta operator, Delta force operator who um, separated under odd circumstances from the army and at, you know, before retirement. And he's, he's the child of a career criminal. So he's got a lot of money that he isn't all that interested in. And uh, he's a philanthropist trying to, to outlive his father's reputation. But at the same time, he's got all of this expertise on on kicking doors and rescuing people. That's what, until very recently, that was the primary mission of these high-end special forces operations was hostage rescue. And the the protocols are different when the military does a rescue than if say the FBI does a rescue. And uh, the essential difference is that the rescue is the mission in the military. In the civilian world, the mission is making sure that the bad guy gets convicted and that the, and that the, the hostage is rescued. But the ho- rescuing the hostage is not the primary focus in right. domestic um, hostage rescue. So I got this idea of, of a guy, I had done a nonfiction book called Six Minutes to Freedom that featured a Delta Force operation. And I got extraordinary access and to a lot of these people who will talk to me and answer my questions and uh, it just it, it kind of dawned on me that Jonathan Grave would be 
a good character. Now, what does he stand for? He he has he's a principled guy. Um, he's he's a gentleman and he's a gentleman, but he's also extremely lethal. And the the, the idea is to to bring justice, to separate, to, to bring the hostage home, the precious cargo, bring the precious ca- cargo home. If the bad guys theoretically were to say, okay, go ahead, take them. We don't want them anymore. Go ahead and take them. Then there would be no violence in the books, but then it wouldn't be a thriller, would it? So it, it's, there's a lot of, so, they so, always do push back. So, and, and go ahead. No, 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 no. Finish up, John. So Jonathan is often often hired surreptitiously by uh, usually by the FBI director with whom he's got a special relationship, um, not in a tawdry way. They just have a lot of dirt on each other. Um, he'll be brought in to do things for the government the governments aren't allowed to do, and often along those same lines. And the stakes in Jonathan's games are usually really pretty high. Do, do you find is uh, like how do you separate him in your mind? Like okay. Jack Reacher might do this, but John, uh, Jonathan Graves would do that. I mean, is there a character differentiation that sets him apart? I mean, he walks the walk like the, the protagonist in this genre, but from a character standpoint, beyond the backstory, is there anything like, you know, he doesn't have a limp, he doesn't have an eye patch, he's not an ex-alcoholic, he, you know, he's not Matthew Scudder or whatever, but how do you, how do you separate him in your mind's eye when you're creating uh, the action for him and his uh, his his movements, if you will, and decisions. Well, Jonathan Jonathan is part of a larger team. Um, he's got boxers, who is his longtime buddy, mm-hmm. um, who's just this enormous human being. He's he's a door breaker too from back in the army days. Um, a young lady that he grew up with that lived that actually was the daughter of the housekeeper in the mansion where he grew up. Turns out to be one of the world's great hackers. He got her out of some legal problems. And now she works with him on the electronic sides of things. He's got a former sheriff, Gail Bonneville, uh, who does a lot of the work for him too, or or with him. So as opposed to the lone Mm -hmm. stranger, like like Jack Reacher, casting no aspersions, I love Jack Reacher. um, He's he's really part of a larger team and he'll he'll combine technology and, and persuasiveness and uh, his, his focus is again, to, uh, to get the hostages back. Okay. So, but, you know, I think there's some commonality in all of these characters. There has to be. And I'm just wondering as a writer, if you ask yourself or if the publisher pushes or your editors push back, if they do it all at this stage of the game and say, would Jonathan, I think he should do this. And you say, and you know, no, no, no. I know Jonathan Graves and he would do that. Yeah, well, one hard line that he draws is he is not an assassin. You know, he's not, that's not his thing. People have died at his hand, but it's always because there was no other choice but to do that. Um, he doesn't do the torture thing, you know, doesn't, all, there, are, there are ethical and moral lines that he okay. will not cross. And there are cases that he will not take because he knows that it will, it will go that way. Got so it. Jonathan is... Jonathan is the man I would really like to be um, okay. in terms of his moral center. Now we're getting at it. Okay. Uh, the latest book, Lethal Game. I started reading it over the weekend. I did not finish it. I'm in it and bang, right out of the gate, John, you really get the action going. Two guys are hunting, jo- Jonathan Graves and boxers. All of a sudden the game warden approaches, gives them a hard time and then boom, action. Tell us about the new book, Lethal Game. Well, that that is the opening sequence. You just gave away chapter one, first half of chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it turns out that Jonathan is the is the focus. He is the hunted. He's not on a hunting trip, but he is being hunted by uh, bad guys from his past. And what he doesn't realize, because he's got no communication, is that his entire support team, including the 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 elderly surrogate mother who kind of raised him after his own mother died they're all under attack and are under attack by well i guess i won't reveal it but they're they're under attack by by folks who are trying to get even for stuff that that he had done previously and um it gets it gets pretty violent pretty fast but they're the motivations it's not so much revenge as who the hell do you think you are coming at my family Mm -hmm. 
the you started out, I believe your first book was No Mercy. Between No Mercy and the new one, Lethal Game, is there a, they all stand alone, but do they all work together in a story arc? And does Graves change or evolve over the, over the series or is he Graves and that's it? And I don't mean that as a negative. Is he locked in or do you see like, oh, maybe he's evolving with the times or whatever? I th- It's a very interesting question, actually, because um, there are 14 books written over 14 years. So I have changed, right? I mean, we all changed. Right. So since I would imagine that for somebody, you know, I write in slow motion. I only see one book a year. But if people were to read all of them, they may very well see changes in Jonathan's outlook and his attitudes. And um, I, I, you know, you get reviews that some books are darker than others, which is never done intentionally, mm-hmm. but any book I think represents the mood of the author at, at the time. Sure. Uh, but no, Jonathan is there. It's not really a series as much as it is episodes that star the same characters that said as a reward to those who have been on the journey with me for all these years you know, that, that, by book after book, there are Easter eggs. You know, there are things in in each story that reflect back on things in the previous story, written in such a way that I don't lose the new reader, but in a way that the, the folks who have been along feel kind of a cool little satisfaction. You know, just that Easter egg moment. Sure, of course. Um, you've got a second series, uh, Victoria Emerson, a female protagonist. Uh, what she's, what is she all about? What makes her different? She's a congresswoman. She deals with uh, uh, the, the world, you know, the world falling apart and blue fire. Uh, what inspired you to write uh, a series with a woman protagonist? And what were some of the challenges in in writing from a female point of view and female choices versus the macho guy? Well, the 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 story, the series uh, for Victoria Emerson is actually rooted in a a, a tour that I took of the Greenbrier Hotel in, in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, which until 1994 was the US government relocation center, which is the place that the house and the Senate would go in the event of a nuclear war. It's built into a mountain inside a hotel with glass doors and all of that. And that's where the house and Senate would continue to do house and Senate stuff as, as the world was involved in war. And as part of the tour, I realized, or that was told, that each member of Congress, all 535 of them, House and Senate, can bring one staffer with them, so up to about 1,100 people, but no family. And it just occurred to me, who would do that? <laughs> right. I mean, you got, you, the world is coming to an end, so you leave your family to be incinerated while you go sit in a safe bunker. I mean, that just, it, it kind of blew my mind. And so I knew that there was a story there and the single mom just kind of made sense. Uh, And to have a a hard hitting, she's a West Virginia representative from West Virginia, which is where I happen to live. And um, her purpose within government when she was, was with the house was to change the way that the house and Senate have done their thing. You change the sort of interlock barnacle laden government system. So when she got to the bunker and told she couldn't bring her two kids, she said, no, I'm out, I quit. And she decided to survive or not, uh, but be with her family and gets got locked out of the bunker. And it turns out that Victoria is just, is a natural leader. People follow her. And it turns out that, that she's the one who uniquely qualified to bring order to the chaos because people listen to her. As far as how difficult was it to write a a woman character, you know, I don't write about sexuality. I write about characters. And so I write about somebody who loves her family or loves his family um, and is motivated to do the right thing at the right time. So that was not a problem with me. It never occurred. I never thought of it, of, of writing a female protagonist. I wrote about a engaging character named Victoria Emerson. Did you run that by, um, the reason I'm asking is I wrote uh, my book that's published as a rom-com. It's called The Guy's Guy's Guide to Love, and it's been called The Male Sex in the City. I had to be, I have strong women characters and flawed male characters, of course. I had to be really careful with writing the female parts, and I made sure I ran it by a lot of women to make sure this is true with how they would, how they would uh, make their decisions and make their choices. 
And even in the workplace, I've working in advertising for many years, the management style between a lot of male bosses and a lot of female bosses was different. And it's just, uh, how did you, did you do anything to, uh, I know a leader is a leader, but did you do anything to make sure that she rang true uh, with females? And the second part of that question is, is the book for more a male audience or is this a way to get females into the genre? Um, it is, I think it appeals equally to the, the stories themselves. I think they appeal equally to men and women. I hear aren't a lot of, of thrillers, I under, as I understand it, that, um, that do have the strong lead female protagonist. Uh, but, you know, there's not a, as, as far as running things past other people, I just don't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not. I, when a work is in progress, I'm not interested in anybody else's opinion because I don't know yet what I think of it. So I'm not going to ask other people. And the last thing I want to do is introduce doubt. I think it just has to ring true. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know you know, this, the whole, it, I don't know that men and women beyond the obvious, I don't think they're that far apart from each other. I, I think there's, there's angst. There's some, some, the different baggage that individuals, not classes of people, that individuals bring with them. In Victoria's case, she's kind of a prepper. She was married. Her husband was killed in the sandbox, but they were um, shooting and hunting and all that outdoorsy stuff has has been a part of her life, Victoria's life uh, forever. And they raise their kids to be independent and outdoorsmen and, and the whole prepper uh, kind of thing. So, you know, that's I think that's probably... It's unusual for any character, um, but maybe it's especially unusual for for a woman. But it, it, that was just never my mindset when I was writing. I was just writing about the character. Okay, John Gilstrap, my very special guest on Guys Guys Radio. We're talking about the new book, Lethal Game, Jonathan Gray Thriller, and also his other books and series. He's got some one-offs. He's got another series with Victoria Emerson. Let's talk about, let's t- take the second half of the interview, John, and talk about process a little bit. How do you come up with the plots that have not been used before in your genre, or or is it like in music where you can come up with a recycled three chord rock and roll song that if you if you have the right hooks in it, it's gonna it's gonna sell. Do you have a your own your own unique take and character development process? I mean, do, do you how do you get your ideas for your stories? Because the genre is so chock chock full of books and writers and these characters that have some similarities. How, how do you come up with your ideas? And do you say, oh, I wonder if this one's been done before or does it matter? You say, this is Jonathan Graves and here we go. I don't concern myself with whether or not it's been done before. Um, well, okay. I'm not going to write about a submarine that defects to the United <laughs> States or, you know, there, there are certain, or about, about a wizard in, in, mm-hmm. in, in junior high. Uh, but in terms of the thriller plots, I, it's the dilemma that I like to address. Uh, in the in the case of of Lethal Game, for Jonathan to be away from his team and away from his special toys, um, the electronics and night vision and all that kind of stuff, and then to be under attack by somebody he doesn't know and th- frankly hasn't even seen, uh, there's there's just bullets flying. I like that idea, mm-hmm. and that starts once I have the premise. That starts the well. Why would he do that? And why would that happen? And how does that make sense? How can he figure it out? And at, at the very beginning, I don't even know who the bad guys are until I start writing. I'm not an outliner. So uh, it, it, it starts with, with just a, a, a kernel of an idea. The book that I'm going to start writing tomorrow, actually, that I have to deliver in October, is based on a case that happened, I think it was in Venezuela. I have to finish the research on it where there's a bunch of missionaries that were kidnapped by the cartels and they're being held for different levels of ransom, depending on who they are. This happened. This is like within the last six or eight months that this happened. I thought, well, that's a really interesting idea to certainly because Jonathan does hostage rescue. So find a way to do a riff on that. And then the next thing is, of course, that's not enough. Then there's, well, what does that then reveal? You know, what's what's the next step? And so it's it's just a, a 
I'm not being coy here because I don't really understand my own process. It's about getting the idea and you start write it, start to write it. And I play with my imaginary friends and well, what happens next? Oh, that'd be cool. Let's, let's, let's do that. Mm -hmm. and, and by the time I'm done, there's a book. In terms of your process, you mentioned you have a due date in, in October. So that means I know, I've seen your YouTube videos. I'm going to paraphrase what you, you seem to be in saying is that you do about 5,000 words a day. First, you go back, you clean up what you did the, the day before, and then you, then you move forward. And that's different. Some people say, start with, I know the last page of the book, and they just write the entire draft. And you seem to go back and you polish as you move along, but you're always adding those 5,000 words, I think it was, each day. Tell, talk to us. Fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred. OK, sorry. Yeah. 15, Five thousand. <laughs> my eyes would be bleeding. Um, sorry. About the that. idea I like to always be working off of a firm foundation. So if what I what I write today, the fifteen hundred words or two thousand words, whatever it is that I turn out or five hundred, uh, they may be crap there. I know there's going to be spelling errors. I know there's going to be all kinds of problems. So tomorrow when I start, I will read what I wrote today and just change the spelling and, you know, get the grammar to be where I want it to be. Maybe word choice. I'm not using the strong enough verbs or whatever. And that by doing that, I now have a running start on what I want to write today. So then I will run through that. And at the end of the day or when at the end of the scene, whatever, or just when my butt hurts, um, I stop and then take a break and then come back and do that again. So by the time I'm done with a first draft, I've really got a pretty clean copy. You know, it's at least a second draft or it could be some sections will be 20 or 30 drafts because it's that middle section that's hard to fine tune. That, do do uh, you know work, Do so. you know where you're going, John? Do you know the end of the story or does that unfold as you're writing the chapters? I know the end of the story in a macro sense. I don't have it in in the specific, sometimes I do, but for the most part, I don't know exactly what the last scene is going to be. Um, frankly, you know, with Jonathan, he he pays the mortgage, so you know, chances are I'm not going to kill him off in in the in the current book. But I've heard him. You know, there's there, and the problem with that, if you hurt a recurring character, then he's still got to be hurt for the next book, right? Mm -hmm. So that that can be problematic. Could you, but I basically uh, know where I'm going. Have you ever, you taken one of the secondary characters like Boxer and it, he seems to be very interesting and say, okay, maybe there's a Boxer book in there. Well, specifically with Boxers, no, because he's just not, he, he is so lethal. I don't, I don't think he would be all that interesting as, as a primary character. I've never re even written a scene from his point of view because he works so well as that, as that shadow guy. But yeah, I've taken um, Gail Bonneville, Irene Rivers, who's the director of the FBI. Um, I wrote about her in my second book, In At All Costs, when she was an FBI agent and uh, in investigating something that goes south. And so I've carried her along and she's, she, probably won't have her own book, although she did actually in Soft Targets. That was all about Irene. Um, it, all, it all depends on who speaks to me, right? It, it, that sounds so writerly. <laughs> some so, when, some characters when, are just stronger than others. What, what time, since you're writing full time now and doing a great job at it, Jonathan, congratulations on Thanks. all your success. Do you have a speci specific routine in terms of writing? Like, do you get up and do Qigong and then write your 1500 words or what do you do? You know, I wish I had that kind of routine. What I normally <laughs> do, and I'm not making this up, I will just today, just like a half hour ago before we started taping this, um, recording the taping, how old am I? Um, <laughs> about a half hour ago, I clicked send on White Smoke, which is the third book in the Victoria Emerson series, which will come out in, in uh, February. And now I've got to start on the Jonathan Grave book. And because I know I've got a October 15th deadline, you'd think I would hunker down and just, okay, I'm going to start writing tomorrow. And I know I won't do that. You know, I will <laughs> I'm going to take time off. I got some stuff to do around the house. And then sometime in August, it's going to, holy crap, I have to write a book. <laughs> and, then, and then it'll be face on fire, work, work, work. So. It's, but you love it. But you love it, right? 
Well, it's 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 better than working in a mine. Absolutely. So, so um, well, at this point in your career, but I don't really have that kind of a process. I'm sorry. Um, my fault. Uh, at this point in your career, though, how much input do you get from your publisher editors? Uh, do you send the finished product? Is there any collaboration with your team? I believe is Pinnacle, or are they just like here it comes, John's new one. Um, I I certainly have an editor. There are. Uh, and she's, she's, <laughs> she will let me know if she's displeased. Uh, but I work really hard to submit clean copy. And so far, I'm usually pretty good. I, my stuff doesn't require a lot of reworking. Um, in 27 books, which is about three, over 3 million words in print, I prove every year, twice a year, that I don't know what a comma does. I don't really understand them at all. So semi you know, get all those, yeah. those, right. yeah, yeah. Why well, don't do semi? I've abandoned the semicolon. <laughs> I just, I just, I don't deal with it. I don't understand it. it a period works just as well. So, how about the M dash? What's your point of view? Well, the M dash. I just recently learned that the the two N dashes that you put in is not an official M dash. Ah. Well. To hell with them. Yes, it is. You know, I, I, I no longer do two spaces between sentences, and that's exhausting. That's a big step for me. So it's they can figure out the end dash. Well, speaking of that, just for those uh, aspiring writers out there, what what is their what what's the preferred format for writing and submitting a draft? And what do you use? Do you use notes on a piece of paper? Do you then do you have it set up on your computer? Like wh which what's your format that you use and the typeface? I'm, I'm a Times New Roman purist. Um, I don't know what's preferred. I can only speak about what I do. Mm -hmm. um, 12 point, uh, one inch margins, no, no spaces, well, no spaces, no extra spaces between paragraphs, um, double spaced, left justified. Uh, I just want it to be, I want it to be clean. I don't like the, the blocking, what do you call it, full justification. I think that's ugly. Um, I don't like fancy typefaces. They just kind of get in the way. Uh, so that's, it, my, it looks like a typed manuscript when I'm done, you know, except I guess type was courier back in the day, but um, nothing fancy at okay. all. Yeah. Now, the. Okay. Um, Hollywood. You, your books have been, I believe, options, or you had some deals made a few times, and then you had turnaround, and you, you kind of, you know, you have a very good attitude about uh, about the, you know, you understand that the industry is kind of a crazy one. I, 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 from my experience with it, I found that it's a financial driven industry. It's really not about the quality. There's some artistic films, if you will. It's really a commercial business. And if you can get the financing, you can get something done. And then there's so many scripts out there. It's almost in a way, it doesn't matter how good the script is. It's like who's attached to it and who's financing it. What's been your overall take on your experience? You have terrific books. You learned how to teach yourself how to write uh, screenplays. Um, I could be frustrating because you were close a couple of times and they're still kind of floating around out there. My take on reading what I've read in uh, Lethal Game is that great TV series, great TV series with Jonathan Graves. And I would I would love to see kind of a, you know, season one, 10 episodes, season two, 10 episodes, that type of thing versus boom, a movie. Uh, I don't know. What are your thoughts? On the whole, Hollywood well, thing. your lips to God's ear. You know, I would love to see. I, I think the long form television series is is magical. Right now, I'm watching The Old Man with Jeff. Me Bridges, too. Jeff yep. Ford, I, I was thinking that FX. It's fascinating. There's so much story that can go into those. I would love to see my my books developed in, into that. Uh, as far as my own experience with Hollywood is concerned, I've done seven. I've been involved with seven or eight different film projects. None of them have made it to the screen. All of them have gotten me a check that, you know, either some of them are big, some of them are not. Um, but I don't understand. The Hollywood business model makes no sense outside of Hollywood. It just, it makes no sense. There's so much money thrown at a high risk project, but you know that you can write that off against the, the successful film two years from now. And somehow 
it works. But in my experience dealing with the people in Hollywood, there's a screenwriter of, of some note, Linda Obst, O-B-S-T, I think, whose film autobiography, is, the title is Hello, He Lied. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, it's a, it's a, it's a different, it's a different business. I, I work with it in a, in a heartbeat. And any of you who have a film of mine in active production, I love you guys. You know, I have nothing but respect in what you do. Do you think, uh, Jonathan, there are certain uh, must haves in your jo- genre that you have to deliver to satiate the appetite of your readers and your publisher? Well, the publisher is happy with, with, if a reader, if enough readers are happy, the publisher is very happy. So, you know, it's, it's kind of driven that way in my experience. And I've been doing this a long time. So I got a few chips in the game. I, I think you have to have, well, there are no rules. Things, some things work when I think they shouldn't. But for me, my rules are, it's got to be, um, a strong character doing interesting things in interesting ways and interesting people, you know, in, in, with, um, in an interesting place. The adrenaline, you know, it's, it's the, that's why people read thrillers. A thriller is the, is the wrong place to have the sprawling essay about the beauty of the desert landscape. And it just, it's, it, mm-hmm. it could be great writing. And I think thrillers are examples of great writing, but it, they're, they're a slave to pacing, you know, boom, 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 boom. It, it's, it's, and it's not, it's not a dead person on every page or blood on the walls in, in every chapter, but the, the driving pull has to have that sense of urgency. Or at least that's what's important to me. Is why is this chapter here? Why is this character doing this? Nothing's easy. Um, and there's always for every action, there's an opposite reaction. Somebody's pulling against it. That's what brings the tension into a thriller. And that I think it's the tension that makes people addicted to thrillers. How is he going to get out of this? How is this problem going to solve? Oh my God, they're going to kill the guy. How, how is he going to survive? That's what, that's what it's about. What do you think, John, is it, what's your, for you? What's your best book? What's your favorite? What are you most proud of? Which is oh, the one that like... You know, this, this sounds like a smarmy answer and, and I don't mean it to be that way, but it's really true. It, it is always the book I'm working on now because okay. if it's not, right. what's the point, right? So um, I'm very proud of all of them. There's, there's only, I won't name which one, one of my early books. Um, it was, it reminds me of a really dark time when I, when I wrote it and it's just, it's not something I care to revisit. I think the book is okay, uh, but it's not, I, I don't think it's my greatest work. Each of the, but each of the Jonathan books, I think is, I, I really enjoy them and I enjoy the process of writing them and the research that goes into it and, and all of that. Um, so I don't really have a favorite per se, except okay. the one I'm writing now. Fair enough. Um, you're a firearms expert and you are all, are all about safety and your books obviously have a lot of firearms in them. And there's so much going on in the country now and people arguing back and forth and, you know, a lot of folks like yourself, they, they understand, you know, that firearms are dangerous if not used properly, yet there's something that people can use and uh, for hunting and for protection or whatever. When you're a responsible, and then you have all, some crazy people out there who do really terrible things. As a responsible gun owner and firearms expert, does it pain you to see all these things going on out there? And do you say to yourself, uh, well, you know, what do you say to yourself with, with that? that? What, what, uh, I mean, you've got to have some type of reaction. Like I can't believe, you know, the last thing you want is some other person to get involved in a shooting and you, you understand firearms and you are all about safety. How do, how do responsible people like yourself, respond to all the craziness that's going on out there. And I'm not political, as you, as you can tell. I'm just curious as to, from a responsible, I don't own a gun, for, maybe, uh, but for yourself, who is an expert, what, what, what do you think about all of this stuff? And I'm not talking about what's legislation and all of that stuff, but just mm-hmm. how do you feel knowing that you're a responsible gun owner? Well, I think it's, ter- you know, I- the, the wanton taking of, of lives is just is always 
awful, right? Um, I, I think that we're in many cases, and it's hard to talk about these things and not to a political line a little bit, but I, I think we're talking about an angry society mm-hmm. and, and that's the root. Uh, I don't, I won't venture into why they're angry, but clearly they are. You see it on the road when people are driving, you see it in the grocery store, people trying to, you know, taking the 90 stuff into the 15 items or less line and, and, and challenging people. Folks uh, killing each other over toilet paper in the early days of COVID. There's there's something strange that's going on, and and therein lies the the, the problem. The the guns themselves, firearms, weapons in general, I don't I don't see as the problem. And you might guess I do own a firearm or two, and um, and I it's the people who are must- afraid of go ahead it must sadden you to when you read some of the news and like because people like yourself they're trained they have safety they do the right thing and then you have people who are completely out of it and doing these horrific crimes that must be it must pain you people people who are responsible firearm owners and then you have to be on the defensive well i'm never on the defense quite honestly okay. but okay. the but uh, yeah i mean it just there there is something broken in American society right now. And you can have, I think everybody would, everybody, I think the vast majority of people would agree that there's something broken in the psyche of America. And now it'll divide up of what is it, whose fault is it? And and there will be no agreement there, right? But but it's to to focus on, on the firearm itself, which is purely mechanical. I got a safe full of them and none of them have shot anybody today, right? I mean, that's sort of the flippant uh, uh, kiss off on these things. Uh, You know, we don't hold cars responsible for drunk drivers. We hold the drivers responsible for drunk driving. And obviously we hold shooters responsible. I hope we do, you know, for for shooting people. It's very complex. I I don't, I, I feel sad irrespective of, of the firearms. I feel sad that we're in this sad, angry place. And uh, I don't, I'm not smart enough to know how to get out of it. I'm not there yeah. myself. You know, I'm, I'm looking out at the forest right here. So okay. I'm good. Well put, totally understand. So Jonathan, John Gilslap, Gilstrap, Lethal Game, a new Jonathan Grave thriller. Um, we talked about what's next for you, but if you want to reiterate What's coming up next? You've got a you've got a Graves novel. You've got an Emerson novel. Anything else? You have any one offs? And you want to tell our well, readers and viewers where they can find out more about you? Certainly. Um, well, back in February, Blue Fire just came out, number two, the second book in the Victoria Emerson series. Lethal Game, the fourteenth book in the Jonathan Graves series, just came out uh, at the end of June, June twenty seventh or twenty eighth, whatever that Tuesday was. Um, I've got a story coming out in an anthology called Hotel California, where um, I'm one eighth I'm with it happens to be here. I've got, oh, I can show it right here. There we go. There we go. That's the, the art <laughs> with Heather Graham and Andrew Child, myself, Reed Farrell Coleman, Don Bruns and, and others that comes out at the end of this month. And then uh, the cycle starts back next, next February with White Smoke, which is the one I just finished a half hour ago. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, congratulations. Thank you so much for being on Guys Guys Radio. You do terrific work. Your novels are fun. They're fast. They're furious. And you, you're, you're awesome. So thank you, John, for being on our show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. If you're enjoying the content and the guests I bring you each and every week to Guys Guys Radio and TV, please subscribe to our channels. Thanks for your support.